Friends of Sing for Science, I'm pleased to announce the launch of our new spin-off series, Sing for Science Labs. This new show invites artists of any stripe, be they musicians, actors, painters, writers, and the like, to come on the podcast and speak with a scientist about a topic of shared interest. Upcoming episodes on Labs feature Talking Heads frontman David Byrne, crime writer Patricia Cornwell, and many, many more. Don't forget to subscribe to Sing for Science on your platform of choice, and please give us a review. I hope you enjoy the show. This is Sing for Science Labs. I'm your host, Matt White. Each episode in this series brings together an artist and scientist to explore one topic of shared interest. Today's topic is secular humanism, and our guests are singer-songwriter Jose Gonzalez and physicist Brian Cox. Jose is a beloved indie folk singer based in Sweden who made his first appearance on this podcast to talk about his experience studying biochemistry as a grad student in the early 2000s. Also making his second appearance on Sing for Science, Brian Cox is a Royal Society Fellow, researcher at CERN, and perhaps best known as presenter on several BBC science programs. Today's topic, secular humanism, can be defined in part as a philosophy that embraces human logic while rejecting belief in the supernatural and any adherence to religious dogma. Jose and Brian, welcome back to Sing for Science. Happy to be here. <laughs> yeah, great to be back. Um, Jose, how did I do in my intro on the, my definition of secular humanism? Yeah, you did uh, great. Um, I, I usually try to mention that we aspire to, for humans to flourish. It's, mm. uh, it's an aspiration. And uh, um, many times you, uh, when you talk to people about humanism, you get stuck in the uh, things that uh, we don't have evidence for. <laughs> And uh, humanists like to start with humans and uh, and uh, who we are and who we want to be, and uh, yeah, what we what type of heights we can reach on an individual and collective level. So it's a wholly op optimistic philosophy. Yes. Uh, feel free to fill in Brian when you want, <laughs> and in uh, the way I, I've heard people talk about it, it's definitely uh, optimistic. It's aspirational. The, there's a Humanist Manifesto that's been changed a couple of times, and the latest one is pretty short. and And the, the whole ambition is to have a, a manifesto that isn't that dogmatic, that mm. is uh, um, sort of just uh, ethical outlook, a philosophical outlook on life, uh, mm -hmm. where you try to figure out who we are and where we can go, basically. Mm -hmm. um, and usually that, that leads to science and reason <laughs> and logic mm -hmm. and rationality uh, and all the rest. <laughs> mm -hmm. I, I think um, I start from the basis that there, there are tremendously interesting questions. That, uh, yeah, existence is a, is a mystery, <laughs> right? It's, I mean, I, I, I'm often asked, you know, what are the most remarkable structures in the universe? What is it? Is it black holes? Is it giant supermassive stars? Are there galaxies? The, I, I think surely the most remarkable thing about our universe is that it can think about itself. It can understand itself. It can explore itself. My, one of my great heroes, Carl Sagan, said that a, a physicist is a hydrogen atom's way of understanding hydrogen atoms. And when you mm -hmm. think of yourself in those terms, the idea that we're we, each of us, everybody listening now, is just a pattern of atoms. And you think about what they are. The hydrogen in the water molecules is pretty much as old as time. And the, the, and the carbon, oxygen, nitrogen famously was cooked in the hearts of stars that are now no longer here. And so it's a remarkable thing. And so it, it, it's, it's an important question to ask, well, what, what, how did that happen? How did that come to be? It's a it's a tremendous and invigorating mystery. Uh, what the the basis of science, I think, was better summarised by another great hero of mine, Richard Feynman, in, a, in an essay called "The Value of Science." He wrote in 1955, where he said the most valuable thing that you learn in science is that you start from the position of we don't know. So he called that the the I think he called it the open channel. To, to wisdom and knowledge, whatever that is, whatever we're seeking, 
if you start from a basis that there's something that's worth understanding, more than that, it's a tremendous mystery, an invigorating mystery. But you start from the basis that you're not going to guess. You're just going to start from nothing and try to build a picture. Then the, the, to me, that's the, that's the important point about our approach to understanding very deep questions about the universe. And it, it's, it's the acceptance that we, you know, I, we don't even know if the universe had a beginning. Like we, we know that there was a thing called the Big Bang mm -hmm. that, uh, and the universe was very hot and very dense 13.8 billion years ago. We have a measurement back to that time, which is you, you can't argue with, by the way, on the bits like arguing about the distance from London to New York. It's, it's a measurement mm -hmm. that we've made. So, so, but we don't even know whether that was the origin of the universe in time. We have theories the universe was around before that and it was something that happened in a pre-existing universe we don't actually know what time is at the fundamental level. So I think the, the idea of digging, digging into these deep questions and with the, from a basis that you have no idea at all is the, that's where the answers will come from. If indeed we'll, we'll we ever get to them. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I guess the, the topic of, um, uh, like a creation myth uh, is something that uh, most uh, cultures uh, seem to want to have <laughs> and uh, and it's something that um, if, if you look at the modern uh, version of a creation myth uh, it starts like you're saying by by measuring by by experimenting by uh, making calculations and it's a very different type of um, creation myth it but is, but it's, it's, yeah. it's interesting, as you said, that the desire seems always to be there to to ask these questions about origins. Um, so there's something deep within our psyche that wants to know about these 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 mysteries. Let's call them mysteries, because they, they are. Mm. Um, and you're right that the story the the the, the story that science has uncovered so far. Um, we, we uh, although I've said that you start from the basis that we don't know, we know a lot now. Um, uh, so we we know, as I said, we know broadly what well, we know how long it was since the Big Bang. We have a very good idea of how the chemical elements came to be synthesized in the hearts of stars, and even how the hydrogen and the helium, in the primordial building blocks of the elements, came to be from the Big Bang. Um, we have an idea about life on earth the origin of life we we know life was present around 3.8 billion years ago on the planet we have some theories not agreed upon by any means about how that happened we i, I always like to say it's clearly in some sense a transition from geochemistry to biochemistry because you start with a world that has no life on it that's just formed out of some the ashes of long dead stars, as we said, uh, under gravity, and then that, that active geochemistry becomes biochemistry. So we have some ideas about that. Then, but then even the, the story of life on Earth, the, you know, it, I find it one of the most remarkable things we've discovered is that it took almost four billion years to go from the origin of life on this planet to intelligence at our level. Mm. To, to a mm. civilization that can ask these questions. Mm. And that um, we, we talk about meaning, I suppose, in the, the search for meaning in the universe. I, I think it's a reasonable assumption. It's a guess, right? But, it, but it's, I think it's a good assumption to make that the number of civilizations like ours in a typical galaxy, like the Milky Way, might be around one or none, <laughs> or just a few at most. <laughs> And uh, as I said, I, I, I was asked to give a, a a little intro to the COP climate summit in Glasgow, and I I, I made this point that um, to the to the world leaders in a little video that I made that it, let's let's just assume a working assumption that that there are very few planets like this. So that means that whatever meaning is, which is what we're discussing, I suppose, in in this podcast, whatever it is, it clearly exists in the universe because the universe means something to us. Um, we don't know how that emerges from this p pattern of atoms, but I would argue it must, at least it requires something like a human brain to enter the universe. Mm -hmm. And then so therefore, 
th th that idea that this planet might be the only place where complex life exists at this level means that it might be the only place where meaning exists, potentially in a, in a galaxy of 400 billion suns. And we are responsible for it. So th that's the other part. Carl Sagan famously said that there's no one coming to save us from ourselves. So mm. suddenly this philosophy of this idea which might seem rather austere that it's like there's no grand plan there's no you know there's, there's no global universal meaning in the universe the the idea that to me that meaning exists it's local and temporary it exists within us and if we're gone it's gone and it might have disappeared in a galaxy of 400 billion suns potentially forever if we choose to erase ourselves then I think that there's a deep, there's something deep in that thought. This it's very important. It's a good assumption. It's a working assumption. Let's call it a working assumption. It might mean that we're less likely to blow ourselves up. Yeah, that's um, it is a profound <laughs> um, thought. Um, if if you think that we we are uh, pretty much alone with this uh, um, capability of of uh, talking about meaning and uh, mm. yeah and the capability um, of erasing it <laughs> we yeah, also have yeah. that power <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah suddenly there's a responsibility yeah, yeah. because that's uh, i guess one of the things that gets mentioned in within humanism that we talk about the life that we know that we have we we don't know uh i mean as scientists <laughs> you can suppose that nothing was there before birth and nothing after mm -hmm. death. But uh, many people like to think about uh, those uh, times before and after. But for humans, it's, it's, it's this life, this life that we know that we have that's important. Well, this kind of makes a good um, <clears throat> connection to the time that, Jose, you were on the show before, and we were talking about some of the existential questions that your song El Invento raised. And I asked purely out of curiosity what your thoughts were on the why of the universe. Why are we here? And you uh, alluded to something that I later discovered is kind of a central tenet of humanism, which is the why questions aren't the important ones. It's the how. Uh, yeah. So, so um, I guess what uh, we might be saying different things, but I'm, I'm saying uh, that we we are the the human ape that is able to ask why questions mm -hmm. and uh that's amazing but but that doesn't necessarily mean that there are uh, answers out there especially not <laughs> ones that are, are made up without uh, some sort of uh you know nothing to back up them <laughs> they just sound good so um in that sense it's um if you talk about science, I guess it's more about how. But but I think um, if you talk about meaning and and the the search for uh, our, our origins and the the origin of consciousness, uh, I, th I think it's yeah, sometimes it's nice to ask why. Uh, mm -hmm. you, usually you can switch why to how, but it's mm -hmm. um, when once you have agents, uh, so so we are we are. Um, uh, apes that, that can do stuff and mm -hmm. we can do them in way more complex ways because of our brains um, and then we can we can ask why and all of a sudden we might have answers to to the question of meaning on an individual level because uh, humans can give reasons for their quests and for their ambitions um, so so i think uh, yeah yeah it's, uh, it's um the, it, there are there are some theories because uh, you can ask if you have an origin to the universe in time then it's it's a good question isn't it well what 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 does that mean for something to just start existing <laughs> right and then um, so of course the correct answer is don't know as we said but but we can do better than that in a, in a sense because we, we do have for example we have a theory of of what happened before the big bang in a sense in the sense of if you define the big bang as being the time when the universe was very hot and very dense then there's a theory called inflation which suggests that space and time was around before that it was very different though in the universe then it was cold and empty in some sense but it was expanding very fast 
And it's called that's the period is called inflation. And then that, that period drew to a close and all the energy driving that expansion is in something called the inflaton field. It doesn't matter what it's called, really. And it gets dumped into space and heats it up and makes the particles out of which we and all the galaxies in the observable universe are made. And so that, that's, that theory is interesting because it sounds fanciful, but it made some predictions in the, in the mid-1980s, which were subsequently verified. Uh, it made predictions about patterns in the oldest light in the universe, which is called the cosmic microwave background radiation, and patterns that we see in the, in the galaxies today in the sky. So they're not completely random, the distribution of galaxies. And those predictions are remarkable predictions, which were subsequently verified. So you think, OK, th so there's something in this theory. But there's an extension to it called eternal inflation, which is thought natural by some physicists who work in the area, which is that you can ask the question, why did that rapid expansion all stop at the same time? It seems very unnatural. Nothing does that, right? Why, why wouldn't it stop in patches? So you get this picture of multiple universes. It's called the inflationary multiverse, where you get all these... And, and that would be going on now, this process, if that's right. And new, new universes all over the place. And each one of them can quite naturally have different laws of nature. So then there's, there's then a, a kind of a why question comes, which is that, that why is our universe? It's one of the most profound questions, actually. Why is our universe constructed such that life can exist? Which is what we've been talking about. This remarkable property of reality, that atoms can come together and think stuff, right? Why? Is <laughs> why? Um, and, well, the answer in those inflationary multiverse scenarios, so-called eternal inflation... Is, is that all possible combinations of the laws of nature exist in the inflationary multiverse. And so you will, of course, you'll get bubble universes which can think, which have structures that can think and therefore have meaning in them, let's say. And then most of them won't. And so, and so you almost get this answer. <laughs> but I should say that those... So those theories are difficult to test. We don't have a way of mm. testing internal inflation. Although we have a way of testing inflation, which looks good, but it's still a theory. But uh, so, but I mean, I wonder, I wonder if that's satisfying. That's a question to you, actually, Jose. Because, Jose, is, is it a question? Is, is it a good answer? Is it because everything happens. Because <laughs> that might yeah, be the that, answer, yeah. right? It might be. <laughs> yeah, it's so, not very satisfying, though, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> to, to me, that's, uh, that's a part where I sit back, sit back relax and eat some popcorn and just listen to, <laughs> to people like you because that's yeah. uh, mind-blowing and I love it because it's, uh, it brings um, the, a mystical experience to, to that, that comes from yeah. not from um, uh, dreams but from, um, from uh, trying to figure out how, how the cosmos actually works and and um, so it's fascinating and <laughs> but I, uh, and and this is where i'm agnostic so, so i i <laughs> i'm i'm happy to to say that i don't know and i'm happy to sit back relax and and listen to people like you <laughs> talk about so, I love multiverses that. and and uh, yeah <laughs> sit back relax and enjoy the multiverse it's quite a good <laughs> yeah. put that on a t-shirt <laughs> yeah <laughs> you mentioned dreams i just uh <clears throat> was did an episode with a, a Jungian analyst and Carl Jung, um, he said that there is a strong empirical reason why we should cultivate thoughts that, um, that can never be proved, you know, and we're talking about the search for, you know, have finding meaning. And it seems like yeah. it can be found in, in, um, the explore the exploration of both creation mythology and also kind of what you're talking about here, Brian. You just mentioned a couple of theories that are difficult to prove. Yeah, so I, I'm just gonna say that I'm many times when I end, end up talking about atheism or humanism, I sound like the 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 guy who doesn't believe in anything. <laughs> mm. But but <laughs> fantasy, creativity. Uh, letting your imagination run loose, uh, especially when you try to figure out uh, how we should steer our future. Uh, it, it's crucial uh, mm -hmm. and it's uh, natural for humans to, to do it. And so, yeah. 
I love that. I didn't know yeah. that. I hadn't heard that before, uh, the, the, that we should cultivate thoughts that can never be proved. It's, I suppose you're asking questions about the value of thought, aren't you? It's like, does it all have mm. to be shown to be correct or not correct? Do we have to make, do we have to pass judgment on every thought and idea? I suppose that's where that <laughs> is going, that, that the line of thought, isn't it? And the answer yeah. is surely... No, we don't have to pass judgment. Uh, they, they, they're in, a, in and of themselves. The, as as mm-hmm. you said, as a, the, the imagination, creativity. You know, the, do we have to do we have to pass judgment on on it all? No. Mm-hmm. It's, it's, yeah. yeah, never thought of it before. I like that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it just seems because there's often it's it seems as though science and um capital s spirituality are are pitted at odds and it just it seems to me that that doesn't have to be the case you know because spirituality can be a very broad broad category especially when we accept that these ideas that whether or not there is a creative intelligence whether or not the universe had a beginning ever you know these things at least now can't be proven you know, there's really no way. There's strong evidence to suggest one way or the other, I suppose. But no, I, I'm, I mean, I, I hear the concern. It, it it comes up often when I talk to people that are uh, religious or or spiritual with a big S. That uh, <laughs> I I try to mention how I'm uh, like the word spiritual with a small S. Mm. So without you know knowing how consciousness uh, works, um, I'm mm-hmm. I'm totally fine with a momentary explanation that it comes up uh, by all the activity within our bodies, including the neurons, mm-hmm. uh, the firing of the neurons, mm-hmm. uh, and I I don't know the, about the details about that. And I since we are humans, we we need to find language that works for our experiences and that's where i'm i enjoy using the word spiritual but yeah with a small s spiritual mm-hmm. in the sense of uh, talking about the extraordinary experiences that you can have uh, if, uh, many traditions uh, have done this through chanting dancing taking mm-hmm. substances and uh, and uh, many more things <laughs> mm-hmm. and um uh, yeah, yeah, of course, if you're a meditator, of course, that might be part of that spirituality with, with small s. And sometimes uh, people sort of need something extra, and that's the part where I feel like, okay, that's something that's, you know, made up, and it could be a, a help for some people, but mm-hmm. I'm okay to to have that experience those experiences, and I'm looking forward to have more because I haven't had <laughs> yeah, <laughs> haven't tried the many substances <laughs> but, uh, but yeah <laughs> yeah i remember um again going back to carl sagan I, i'm sure you read his book the demon haunted world it's a wonderful book and in that he starts that book by um telling a story about i think he was in a taxi in new york and the taxi driver said oh you're the scientist and uh, so what do you think about atlantis and what do you think about ufos and what do you think about crystals for healing or whatever it is all that stuff and he, and sagan said though he realized quite quickly that this is the first thing is this is not someone who's kind of to to be laughed at or something. It's, it's someone who's really curious and has a desire for wonder, an attraction to mystery, which is what mm-hmm. science is, right? It, that, mm-hmm. that. And so what he realized was that really you should be, attempting to say well th- there are other things th- there's also some remarkable stuff that we do know about like black holes for example they're more bizarre than atlantis <laughs> right they're, <laughs> they're more interesting <laughs> and challenging and stranger but that that human Quant- dis- quantum entanglement is another one. quantum entanglement <laughs> and they're related you know we, we're yeah. finding now it's a remarkable thing that um so then i could i could diverge now into that discussion <laughs> yeah. but, but just to finish what Sagan was saying, he was saying that I, I strongly believe it, that, that it, it's the, the remarkable thing to be celebrated is people's desire for for wonder, right? Wonder and, and magic. Let's call it magic. But again, I don't mean magic. I mean, like the mm. the wonder of it all. I remember Charlie Duke, I spoke to the Apollo astronaut, Charlie Duke, 
about Apollo 16, he walked on the moon, Apollo 16. And he, he had that, he used that phrase when he, he was actually walking out of the interview. We'd interviewed him for some a TV show or something. And he, he turned around and, and we'd talked about the moon and the experience of standing on the moon. And he turned around and he just said, it's the, it's the wonder of it all. It's, and, and I thought, that's what, what a beautiful phrase. And so that's, to me, that's what I see when I, when I see people are interested in stuff that, you know, we might, I, I might find a bit, you know, whatever, Atlantis, let's say to you. So I'm sure mm-hmm. there isn't a strongly held community on the internet that believes in Atlantis. So I can, it's mm-hmm. one thing I can choose that I won't get a load of <laughs> abuse for on Twitter. But, <laughs> yeah. but So let's say Atlantis. But actually it's, it is, um, it, it's, it's understanding that people's desire to look above, beyond the horizon and see interesting things that are perhaps terrifying and wonderful and fascinating. That's, that's humanity. That's being human. And it's how mm. you direct that, which is a secondary thing, really. Well, the, the worst mm. thing is not to be curious, to exhibit right. no interest <laughs> in anything at all. Um, the, the black holes, by the way, I should just say, the, the study of black holes, so it's, it's been studying quantum entanglement across the event horizon of a black hole. It has been a really fruitful thing. That, that It's part of the process by which Stephen Hawking discovered that they have a temperature. But it's led to this profound challenge. It's called the black hole information paradox. And it's, about, and it's leading us into a, a theory where space and time emerge from something deeper. And you might see it said often in... in kind of popular magazines and stuff, that we're all holograms. Well, there's a kind of Atlantis-like statement, right? We're all holograms. What does that mean? <laughs> but actually, there are, our picture of reality is getting stranger and stranger by the day. So, so I think it's, hmm. you know, it's the height of arrogance, and it would be wrong, as, for all these reasons I've explained, to say that we, we know everything. And there is, you know, it's really, you know, our, our understanding is of this concrete reality and there is three dimensions of space and there's time and there's this thing called space time and all that stuff. We're, we're getting glimpses all the time that there are deeper pictures that are very weird indeed. Yeah, no, it's uh, it's <laughs> amazing and fascinating. I, yeah. I, I, I hear um, uh, like a skeptic, uh, someone who's skeptic about humanism uh, asking... Uh, uh, Asking what, uh, but uh, what about morals and uh, do the does humanist, do humanists <laughs> have anything to say about that? And, and we do, of course. But uh, <laughs> well, I just as a I do. I mean, I mean, the one thing is related to what I said earlier. For me, is this idea that if 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 you think that meaning is local and temporary by which I mean it's a property of human brains on this planet, and there are very few places where that exists, then I think there's a moral, there's a morality or a moral imperative that emerges from that view, which is, as I said, that if we are the only island of meaning in the Milky Way galaxy, which is an ocean of 400 billion suns, then there's a moral responsibility not to destroy ourselves. So, yeah, I think a morality, there's a morality emerges for me in that there is a, in a sense, I remember Carl Sagan saying something at the time and I thought, I don't understand it. And he said that something like we have a responsibility to the cosmos from which we sprang. I think that's how he put it. And I thought, what are you, what do you mean we have a responsibility to the universe? That sounds bizarre. But of course, in a sense, we do. If it, let's imagine that this is the only place where thoughts exist, right? Just let's imagine that mm. it's possible. Then there is a sense, isn't there, in which 13.8 billion years of cosmic evolution would be the point of it. Because there is a point in, in a sense that we exist would be erased in a moment and we'd be responsible for it. So I do think there's something in that idea that the it's obviously an abstract, was it, it's a, I wonder what you think about it. It's kind of an abstract idea that you could say, you could levy the criticism, right? You could level the criticism that, what, what do you mean? It's pointless. Existence is pointless. So you can always take that view, 
It is true that as far as we understand it, the universe is one day going to be devoid of all life and meaning because it's expanding and accelerating in its expansion. Maybe it's think all the heat death and no information will be processed. So everything will be gone and every no record of anything that existed in the past will exist. It will all be erased. And in that sense, yes, existence is pointless. But so but the fact that at this moment in cosmic time, there is the possibility of intelligence even though it's temporary, seems to me to be important. So w I, I'm, I'm interested to know which one you think. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so I, does it have I, to I, be like, eternal? Yeah. Does it have <laughs> to be eternal to be meaningful? I'd say no. Yeah, I think it's um, you, you can have many different strands of answers to, to that question, the, the question of meaning. And another one is uh, f from a, just from a personal point of view, what kind of things do I like and dislike or enjoy or you know, suffer from, and, and that's where you can, uh, the, hum the humanist outlook uh, is okay for us to look around, look around all the different cultures and, and traditions and, and uh, philosophers, and figure out which parts uh, make sense to us. Uh, and that's, so from a, if you start from just one person, you can uh, get meaning for that person, and then all of a sudden you can also go towards the collective and you get meaning from a collective and um, so um, so th I think th those are two different uh, yeah. aspects trying to, to figure out how to think about meaning one one on a cosmological mm -hmm. <laughs> level and yeah, uh, one yeah. from the first person perspective um, yeah yeah having consciousness as the center yeah consciousness is the center that's the way I think about it there's a, Jose, you had recommended a book, a book called, um, I think it was called The Little Book of Humanism. Is that it? Yeah, yeah, that's it. And there's a, it's just a, you know, it's um, a bunch of one page meditations. And there was a really cool thing that I liked, which I, I find to be sort of unifying um, for different points of view. And uh, the, is a longer quote, but the first, the first I find, mo first piece I find most compelling, it says, all the atoms that make up your body existed before you were conceived and will be there at the end after you have gone. I know that nothing is destructible. Things merely change forms. I really love that. That really resonated with me. Yeah, and also we, we think that um, uh, information is conserved in the, it's one, it's been one of the central um, ideas that has led to a lot of research into black holes that it, it appeared that they erased information from the universe for a long time. So Stephen Hawking's calculation of the radiation, the Hawking radiation of a black hole said that the information, the, the radiation was information free. So it meant that if you jumped into a black hole and then the black hole evaporated away, then you'd have gone completely. You do it utterly mm. erased, right? Now, none of the mm. laws of nature behave like that. They conserve information. It, we, in a series of papers in 2019, it seems to have been proved that the information comes out. So it, actually, it's not even your atoms. In, in some kind of very abstract sense, uh, uh, the information that is you it persists forever in a very abstract mm. sense. It's, it, by abstract, I mean, it's the same sense that if you burn a book, then if you could collect everything, all the photons and all the ashes and, the lo and measure it all precisely, then mm. according to the laws of physics, you can reconstruct the book. So it's not a great deal of comfort to the book. <laughs> mm. <laughs> if you, you know, yeah. you're not going to get reconstructed. But it is, mm -hmm. there's something, I think, quite quite interesting in the idea that even not only the atoms but even the 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 information in some sense is still there when you've gone even if you get thrown into a black hole we now think you come out mm. again ultimately <laughs> scrambled admittedly beyond <laughs> beyond any possible conceivable reconstruction yeah. but you're still there in some kind of sense mm -hmm. <laughs> she's kind of interesting speaking of things that cause that that rob me of any feeling of comfort <laughs> just this idea that the universe always was really makes me sick to my stomach i just i've ex 
<clears throat> I don't Sit know back, why. Relax I'm, and eat some popcorn. <laughs> I'm not, that's the last thing I want to do. It's just, it just. <laughs> I wonder, Brian. What are? Is there anything else that you can tell us about that? Like, if from a a, a physicist's point of view, who has a zoomed out perspective on on the universe, what else can you tell us about? What is that that cosmological view look like? The universe has always been here and always will be. <laughs> I don't think. I, I think the advice to eat some popcorn is probably the best. Like, <laughs> but the uh, the the thing is that so we do know that the universe was very different in the past. So we have a photograph of what's called the cosmic microwave background radiation, and there are no stars and no galaxies in it. So we we, we know that the universe looks like it what we th used to think of as a beginning, right? the Big Bang. So we, we know that. But mm -hmm. as I said, um, the idea that was an event, something that happened in a pre-existing universe that put the universe into that state, is um, it's, it's a possibility. It, it should be said, so for the, more, for the scientific listeners, the, so S Stephen Hawking and Roger Penrose proved that if you just have Einstein's theory of general relativity, then you have a singularity in the past. So it, it looks like a beginning, a, you know, a moment in time um, when it began. But the moment you put quantum theory into it, all bets are off. We, we don't know what, what it means. We, we don't even know what time is. So you, you won't find many physicists speculating Either way, in a sense, it is possible the universe is eternal, as you, as you said. It, we don't understand enough to make concrete statements. I'm interested to know why it bothers you, because it, but from my perspective, it bothers a lot of people that the universe is go going to exist forever, but it will mm -hmm. get to a state called the heat death, where there will be mm -hmm. nothing. So that nothing in the future yeah. bothers people. Mm -hmm. I've never met anyone for whom got really worried about the past. It's just destabilizing. I, I just feel like I've got no ground beneath my feet. In a way, I, 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 I get it. It's just that for me, it's, it's something that I've been training to, to, if I don't know something, just be okay with agnosticism, because that's what you, that should be the, the way to approach most things mm. <laughs> in, in life. And um, so that's, that's why I, I mean, sit back, relax and listen to someone who knows yeah. <laughs> a bit more. Yeah. <laughs> it's bothered loads of people. There's a quote I'll look off. It, this idea that, um, that the, the universe is somehow, you know, ev evolved from something in, into, and it will be meaningless in the future. The, this heat death idea. Um, mm. bo bothered people it's bothered people historically and there's a great um, I'll, I'll find the quote which is about mm. this it's called statistical yeah. mechanics I want to include a plug to see Brian's show Brian I had the good fortune of seeing you at the Beacon Theatre in New York last year and um, oh yeah you know you'd you'd, you'd, you'd um, uh, describe the, the Big Bang event as actually having happened and there was a fantastic moment when you said the Bing Big Bang is not a theory. I can fucking see it. <laughs> <laughs> there is that. Yeah, so you can see yeah. the universe was hot and dense. Yeah. <laughs> this is, a, this is yeah. the, I found the quote. It's about this idea of heat death. And the, the, the science is called statistical mechanics. And it was famously Boltzmann and people in 19th century science initially, where they were wrestling with this idea of heat and temperature and order, entropy, these ideas. And there's a great textbook. It's by David L. Goodstein. It's a very famous textbook on, 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 that, on this subject. And it begins like this. It says, Ludwig Boltzmann, who spent much of his life studying statistical mechanics, died in 1906 by his own hand. Paul Ehrenfest, carrying on the work, died similarly in 1933. Now it is our turn to study statistical mechanics. <laughs> That's the start of the textbook. <laughs> Count me out. So these are the kind of <laughs> the, the, these questions yeah. bother bother people, you know. Yeah, there's a curiosity itch that needs to be yeah. scratched. <laughs> yeah, that show's changed a lot, but actually, in it, it, that was the start of this tour that we're still doing, um, and it's changed massively. 
and um and actually got this idea of meaning i did a version of it recently in at sydney at sydney opera house with the sydney symphony orchestra where we had we we had this music it became a conversation the idea was to can we put these ideas we're talking about can we set them again sort of put, make a dialogue between these great composers it was Sibelius Mahler Richard Strauss is also spoke Zarathustra this wonderful piece of music mm. which everyone knows the first minute of which is the worst bit which is used in 2001 the Elvis bit you know, the sunrise <laughs> and then then it, that bit and then it gets brilliant uh, i mean it's good you know it's dramatic it is a brilliant piece of music i'm kind of joking but it's equally brilliant for the next 26 minutes so we put all these ideas together and the idea was that i profoundly believe it actually that that music and art and philosophy theology right, the, all the things we're talking about these are different lights that you can shine on this problem of the mystery of existence uh, and and we have access to the shadows. It's Plato's cave, right? We, we, so mm. science is a light and music is a light and art is a light, poetry is a light. And, and the more lights you can shine on it, the more shadows you have and the more chance of getting some kind of feeling, a picture of, of, of these, uh, or an answer emerges. Mm. And it was just wonderful to shine, have the... Mahler thought about this stuff right i mean he was he, he had an awful time he was you know he thought about death and mortality and famously said and i wonder what jose thinks about it, he's famously said if, if i could when asked to describe his music he said if i could describe it in words i wouldn't have written the music it's a different mm -hmm. language that that can so i, I think that and it was a great f fun to take this show that you shot in, in an early form in, in the beacon theater in new york mm -hmm. and evolve it into something that has a symphony orchestra with it and and something emerges that i didn't expect so some some deeper mm. insight for me anyway i look forward to, to look forward to see it it's, but do you think <laughs> that i mean the music's a different it, it's it, it delivers insight and emotion that can't be delivered any other way doesn't it yeah yeah that's um uh, it can probably be, be hacked at some point <laughs> but you know, no I, yeah i think uh, that that's the part where where I think humanism deals not only with with what is and what isn't. It also centers on the human experience and yeah, mm. music and and uh, creativity and arts, uh, which is are miraculous, central to to who we are and who and what yeah, miraculous and who we want to who we want to be, mm. Mm. what we want to experience. Um, this has been super cool. Thank you. It's it's really fun. <laughs> oh yeah, no, thank you. It's a real pleasure. I've been wanting to do this for, like you said, for ages. So I <laughs> wish we could do it in the same yeah. room. Yeah. Because now we well, could go out and continue the conversation over yeah. a beer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it felt short, <laughs> but it, it was really fun. Well, thank you guys, and um, wish you both the best. Um, Jose, I hope you can see Brian's show. Brian, are you going to Scandinavia? Uh, we, we, we've been to Scandinavia with it, but I think we'll put, we'll go again. And the aim is to, yes, to do these, these symphonic shows, which are, mm. they're, they're a labor of love. I mean, when I say to my promoter, I've got 85 musicians and, yeah. <laughs> you know, and they go, what? <laughs> what <are Yeah>. you? <laughs> Bring a DJ. <laughs> exactly. So, but, but I hope to, mm. I'd love to do it in Stockholm at that, the, I, I did an event once with the Radio Symphony Orchestra in Stockholm, and it was so wonderful. Otherwise, I'll just take a trip to the closest city. Yeah, I just need to convince a, a, a Scandinavian promoter to f ah. take the risk <laughs> on eight, you know, like I said, EC5 <laughs> musicians, LED screens, <laughs> and everything in a concert hall. <laughs> I'll ask around. <laughs> yeah, we'll make about eight kroner. <laughs> it's, it's a super cool show brian you're mm. you know carrying the carl sagan torch so just really you're a great communicator thank you so much be sure to catch jose live in select north american cities this april on the 20th anniversary veneer tour for those of you in the uk you can explore the secrets of the universe with Brian Cox and Daniel Harding at the Royal Opera House this summer in this special event combining groundbreaking science with the power of a live orchestra. Sing for Science is co-produced by TalkHouse and made possible in part by a grant from the Simons Foundation. 
Our music is by Panoram. Social media manager is Bailey Constis, and digital producer is Keenan Cush. Special thanks to Brian Long, Morgan Johansson, Stephanie Poulter, and Will and Rosie Wood for their help with today's show. If you like this episode, the best way you can support us is to give us a review, tell a friend about the show, and subscribe on your podcast platform of choice. For more information, go to singforscience.org or follow us on social media at Sing for Science. Thanks for listening.